Welcome to Go Vote Omaha, presented by the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha. I'm Jerry Simon, a League member and your host. Each program, we talk about public policy issues that are very important. We hope you'll discuss those same issues, and then at election time, you'll be ready and willing to go vote. Our topic for this program is human trafficking, and our guest is Sakura Yorogama uh, uh, Campbell, a crime victim advocate with the Sarpy County Victim Witness Unit. Welcome, Sakura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's start out with telling our viewers, um, most of them probably know, but human trafficking, sex trafficking, is it the same thing? Define it for well, us. Well, there's human trafficking, which is kind of the big umbrella, and then there's sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And right now, the Nebraska Human Trafficking Task Force, our main focus has been on sex trafficking and really educating the public on sex trafficking. And the easiest and shortest definition for sex trafficking is the buying or selling of a person and your, for commercial sex through the means of force, fraud, and coercion. Okay. And that's probably the simplest and easiest way to define human trafficking is the buying and selling. Okay. So for, for viewers, does that make it different than what they would understand as prostitution? Is there a difference? There is a difference. A lot of people talk about, um, you know, people are voluntarily doing this. They want to be uh, out there selling themselves. And while majority of uh, commercial sex is actually found under trafficking, about 70 to 75%, so there's still a percentage that may not fall under trafficking, but still be defined as prostitution. But in my personal opinion, I think it's all trafficking because I don't know one person that I've ever met that willingly said, I want to sell my body and for profit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a lot of times if they do, they're doing that because they need money to pay rent, to pay the bills. Maybe they have an addiction that they're trying to feed. So to me, while a person has a choice and may voluntarily be doing that, I don't really see that as that really being their choice when they're doing it because of another means and a need that needs to be met. Okay. Is it more widespread than in the past? This is not a new problem, but... No, it, this has existed as long as humans have existed. And I think it's with the internet, has um, helped, sadly, this um, industry flourish because you now have quicker access to victims mm -hmm. and uh, just, you know, and quicker access to the information. So we become more aware of it being out there because we have access to news 24 seven. We don't have to wait for the weekly newspaper in our small towns. We have it on our phones everywhere. So it seems like it's more widespread. It's, it's always been here. Okay, and what we want to get into what makes a person vulnerable to becoming a victim, and maybe the best way to do that is for us to get right into your own story about um, you're a survivor. So tell us your story. Absolutely. Um, when my experience with trafficking was when I was actually 27, so a lot of times the, a lot of the data and statistics talks about children being trafficked at very early ages, and that's usually the, the entry or the recruitment age in like the tween to teenage. Mm -hmm. um, but even though my experience was as an adult, my trauma experiences as a child, I think kind of led to that path. And um, I had moved from Omaha to another state about two and a half hours away, and this was the first time I'd lived away from my family. So right there, there's a vulnerability. I'm separated from my comfort zone, people I know. Um, I used to think, well, and I've always thought I was a strong person on the outside, but on the inside, I was you know, feeling like I'm, I'm always striving for that connection with people. And I think it was that, that need to connect with other humans that led me to making some choices um, to be in relationships that were less than healthy. Uh, and some downright abusive. And that's what this relationship was. It started off, you know, he wooed me, it was great, I'm gonna, you know, welcome you, I'll rescue you because you don't know anybody here, I've got money, so, you know, you can have all these wonderful things. And we started dating, and the abuse started right away. It started verbally. He isolated me from my friends and my family, so uh, taking my phone. And then he broke the phone that I had, so we had to get a cell phone plan together. Mm. So he had access to anybody I had contact with. 
Um, I couldn't go anywhere without him. And, and then the physical abuse started. And when that wasn't enough, he's like, well, we should get a joint checking account because we're now living together, and so we can share the bills. <laughs> and um, what happened then, it escalated to where he would take all the money when we would get paid, and we'd have to go to the local strip clubs. And he would spend hundreds of dollars there um, buying lap dances, and it just it kept growing and growing to where it, the entertainment was no longer involving just him. I now had to become a part of it. And it just, it just kept going. And then now the only way I can get my money to pay my rent and pay my bills is I had to do things that he wanted me to do. And it meant involving other people. And so you've got the force, fraud, and coercion right there mm -hmm. because you know, it may seem like, well, she's going along with it, she's consenting, and it may look like that on the outset, but on what's really going on behind the scenes is a lot worse. So, um, you know, it was not by choice that I was there, it was more out of survival, and uh, getting out of that situation would have meant losing my apartment, losing my job, things that were very important to me that I had worked so hard to achieve. And it was through a course of random events uh, that I was able to get transferred back to Omaha and, and his job had already transferred him up here. That I was able to use my mom and my sister and they helped move me out. And I was able to get out. And you know, that's I think the nutshell version <laughs> of events, but it was a, it was a two year ordeal. Okay. And, um, it was, you know, something I would never wish on anybody, but looking back on it, and now that I know what trafficking is, uh, it took about 12 years after I was out of that experience for me to actually know, oh, trafficking, that's what that experience was. It wasn't just an abusive boyfriend. He went from being my abuser to being my trafficker when he forced me to have sex with other people in order mm -hmm. to get my rent paid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was that realization that I could look back on that experience and I see where the vulnerabilities are. The isolation, the constant abuse, the being on eggshells, and literally it was out of survival. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I feel very fortunate that I was able to get out because a lot of people that find themselves in similar situations don't always have the same supports. So their vulnerabilities may be not having a family connection. Homelessness or chronic homelessness is huge. Uh, you know, you've got mental illness, struggles, addictions, mm -hmm. and at the heart of it is trauma. People that have experienced trauma and even to be trafficked as an adult, uh, a lot of the adults that I've met that their experience was as an adult, they experienced a lot of pretty horrific trauma as children. And the impact that that has uh, as we grow, it may not manifest in ways that are so visible to everybody, but to other trauma survivors. And now with all the education about human trafficking, we're able to identify uh, a lot more of the vulnerabilities and to be able to respond to those needs of the survivors now. Okay. Well, it sounds like your experience was um a one that was just you, and there are other situations where there are more women that um, may be trafficked by one person. Um, mm -hmm. Were there other women um, that he was trafficking as well, or? To my knowledge, no. Uh, but I, and I think he was, his was typically just one person at a time. But he, you know, early on in our relationship, he made it very well known that he had an abusive past, but didn't say, oh, I abused these women. Mm. But he kind of hinted at what his previous relationships were like. And, you know, I thought, I can handle this. I, I know a lot about domestic violence, so I thought, you know, maybe I can show him I'm a good person and he doesn't need to do those things. And, you know, a lot of times people in those situations think like, we think we can either change the person or show them how good we are, and so they're going to change. Uh, but that's not the case. And um, he took what I thought were really wonderful strengths that I had mm -hmm. and turned them into vulner vulnerabilities. 
So that's something that can happen too, and that's you know, another way to say that this can happen to anybody. Uh, it's not just the person that grew up in an abusive household that's living on the streets, that's, you know, feeding an addiction. I mean, it, it can happen. And we've seen, you know, a lot of the women, some women come from great families. Mm -hmm. Some may have grown up in the foster care system. But it's the experiences that they had uh, that I think ultimately lead us down this path. And it's, it sounds like it's fairly typical for someone to, t it takes a while to figure out what kind of situation you're in and that that's what you're experiencing. Would, is that accurate? Would that Abs be true? Absolutely. And a lot of the victims and survivors that are in trafficking don't even realize that that's what it is. And a lot of the survivors I've worked with it's like years later, and it's only because we're talking about it that people realize that's what that was. Most people are not gonna come up and say, hi, I'm a trafficking victim, can you help me? It doesn't work like that, um, but a lot of people just don't recognize that that's what's going on because there's so many other dynamics at play. And a lot of times, uh, they may be forced to use drugs mm -hmm. or they may already have an addiction and so that just keeps getting fed to them and that's you know that's another way to kind of keep someone under your control right and once you did um, escape basically from the situation um, it's pretty more or less you're describing a slavery situation too that's what it is were you worried about him I mean did he just stop contacting you did, were you worried about him um, following you trying to get you to come back to that situation? Um, his job transferred him out of state. So Lucky for that, yeah, that worked in my favor mm -hmm. for sure. And, you know, I think just having my family around made a world of difference because I had those people to help keep me safe. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I still wondered and we still had contact even after I left. We still had contact for about three or four months. Okay. And I finally got to the point where I'm free, I, I don't need this, and changed my number and was okay. able to move on. Okay. Doesn't mean that even these 15 years later that I don't still think about it and what that, the impact that that experience had on me. Um, but on the same token, I, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't do it again by any mm -hmm. means, but you know, had I not had that experience, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today, you know, trying to educate people on, on what's really going on in our communities, and we can no longer be ignorant and say, not in my backyard, because it's, it's here and it's okay. happening. Okay, that brings us right into, let's talk about people might say, well, that doesn't happen in Omaha, this is the Midwest. But um, pretty much I-80 and I-29 are literally human trafficking highways, are they not? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and there was a recent study that was done at Creighton University um, that looked at a website that was probably responsible for about 80% of the commercialized sex um, trade, basically, in the country advertising for that. And it showed it touches all parts of the state, from Scotts Bluff to, this was the shocker for a lot of people, to West Omaha. So could you talk about that a little bit about, you know, in Nebraska, in Omaha, there is trafficking going on. Absolutely, and um, even you know through the Women's Fund and then the Creighton Human Trafficking Initiative, you can even go uh, go on their websites and see the heat map that shows all the hot spots, um, but essentially the entire state of Nebraska. And it's not just in the highly populated cities; we're talking rural communities. Um, and of course, you know, the, I think one of the biggest shockers for a lot of people was when they narrowed it down to show the Omaha population. Of course, you've got the downtown area. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got the hotels, a lot of entertainment uh, industries going on. But then in West Omaha, everybody was kind of stumped, like, how is this happening? Well, this is a primarily online business, so it's not that hard. You have the means, mm -hmm. you've, you've got the money, you've got easier access. Uh, so there's a lot of buying and selling happening in West Omaha, like around you know the Elkhorn area, okay. and um, you know it's not just happening up and down certain streets. 
It's happening in truck stops, yes, but it's happening in hotels, in restaurants. I mean, it's literally happening everywhere. And I think once we become aware mm -hmm. of what human trafficking is, and to me, most importantly, the impact that it has on the victims and survivors, then I think we are in a better position to, to do something. Uh, but certainly, you know, the West Omaha was kind of a real eye-opener for a lot mm -hmm. of people. And, you know, and then Valley, you know, so Western Douglas County. So um, right. I think a lot of it also starts with porn addiction. And that's something that really hasn't been openly addressed in our community is the huge number of primarily men, but even women with porn addiction. And it starts off, you know, watching videos, seeing pictures, and, and it'll escalate to where they're like, okay, well, let's, you know, try this out. So now they're buying a human being. And, you know, I try to get people to understand you're not buying sex, you're, you're buying a person. Mm -hmm. And you're going to use them for sex. And so if you, you know, if we can try to get people to look at these are, we're human beings, you know, we're not an object. So whether you think there's anonymity to it at all, there's really not is what you're saying. Right, right. I mean, you know, I don't look at myself as like the poster child or the face of trafficking, but you know, I don't look so different from anybody else in my neighborhood. So it's, I mean. Which is probably true right. of those who are buying as well. So Absolutely. You, they could be our next door neighbor, family members, um, you know, not going to go into details, but certainly in news stories um, that show, you know, the people that have been arrested, uh, it, it runs the gamut of businesses, mm -hmm. all the way from high, you know, high businesses down to, you know, someone that just works a part-time job. Okay. Are there any particular um, events or um, times of the year that trafficking is more prevalent in Omaha? I mean, some people would say, oh yeah, the College World Series, that's a, that's a time for a lot of buying and, and, and selling, basically. Um, Absolutely. And would you, would you say that that's true? That Absolutely. Time of year? And over the past several years, there's been he several stories uh, that occurred at the College World Series. But any kind of big event that's going to be a draw for people, even concerts. Okay. Um, Berkshire Hathaway weekend is always uh, a big draw for people from all over the world. So that's an opportunity for traffickers uh, to, you know, to sell people. Uh, the Super Bowl, Olympics, major sporting events around the world are always huge, mm -hmm. huge draws. So. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely there. Okay. Um, the profile of the typical, typical trafficker, primarily men, you said anything else that would distinguish um, a, the typical trafficker for anyone? They're not really because, again, the traffickers look no different okay. than, than the victims. Uh, you know, there's even been cases where the women were traffickers. And again, just like with the victims and even the buyers, it, it runs the gamut of all ages, genders, races, all backgrounds. It's not, you know, just the guy with the gold chains and flashing mm -hmm. the money that we, you know, stereotypically put out there. And that's just a thing when people say, well, what does, how am I going to know if I see a trafficker? Yeah. Well, you know, look next door, look, you know, look around you, look at the people that you know. Um, I mean, you don't have to suspect everybody, but there's little indicators that may come up that, um, you know, certain behaviors that I think are, once you're aware, maybe more obvious. Okay. But yeah, there's no one look to, uh, okay. to a trafficker. Um, the Coalition on Human Trafficking has said we should, they have a little brochure they've done, mm -hmm. that we should realize, um, recognize, and respond on, in fighting human trafficking. And so you talk about there are clues. Um, so would you talk about that? What, what things um, should the general public, a person, be looking for? Are there other things that professionals like um, physicians might be looking for, nurses, teachers? that should be looking for as well? What kind of clues should we be looking for? I think one really good opportunity, and this was even from my experience, is in the medical field. And so addressing the professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my experience in the early 2000s, I had to go to the emergency room uh, various times, and every time he was with me. 
I was never alone. So uh, that's always a great opportunity, you know, if you need to do some tests or mm -hmm. my favorite is, you know, ask for a urine sample, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you need to be able to separate that person from whoever they are with um, and kind of take that ownership because there's no way you can ask them to have the person step out. But take that ownership and get that person alone and help, help build that trust to let them know that, uh, you know, that you can assess, like, are you safe? Do you have a place to go? Are you being abused? Um, that's a really good indicator. When traveling, a really good indicator is uh, the person cannot usually possess their own identification. Usually their trafficker has hmm. that. So looking for little signs like that. Again, something when we're in a busy airport, we're trying to get to our next flight and you know, not really looking around, but I think when you take the time to really look at what is happening around us, it's, it's there. Um, you know, because the person's not necessarily being held by chains. We're not l always locked up. Some are, yes. But the, the emotional and psychological chains that are there are sometimes harder to break than the physical chains. Okay. And, and another thing that, um, in kind of a list of clues or things to look for, um, multiple cell phones. Is that, is that one of the things you kind absolutely, of be looking for? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, multiple cell phones, uh, you know, even tattoos that are uh, like barcodes. Um, a lot of times the traffickers... On the victim. Right, they'll right, actually yeah. have like a barcode, wow. like that you would scan at a store. Um, you know, certain tattoos with the trafficker's name, uh, certain references like that. So, uh, you know, we're working with local tattoo shops to, you know, kind of identify when people are coming in to get tattoos to kind of screen for uh, that potential, you know, trafficker to be bringing in their victims. Okay. What about in hotels? What should someone look for and what should you do if you're suspecting that something isn't quite right? Um, what to look for, again, you know, one person, usually the trafficker, is calling the shots um, and seeing frequent people coming in, and especially in smaller hotels, it might be a little bit easier. Or if you're um, working laundry or something, you kind of get to used to seeing who's staying there. And so seeing frequent strangers coming in and out of the same room would certainly be a good indicator okay. uh, that that's going on. And, um, you know, but again, you may not always see that, but we do say, you know, recognize what trafficking is and know that it exists in our community. Right. And, you know, if you see something, report it. And it may not pan out that it was trafficking, but it's far better to report it. If it's right there, call 911, you know, if you okay. think that person's in danger, or call the National Human Trafficking Hotline through Praxis, the 888-3737-888. Um, and that's the easiest way to remember it. And I always tell people, plug it into your phones because if you suspect that there's trafficking going on, you can call that number. They'll direct you to a local program in your area okay. and you know, get the ball rolling. And of course, 911 if it's an emergency, right. if that someone's right. in danger. But again, you may not see blatant signs, but a lot of times we kind of have that feeling, mm -hmm. that gut feeling, and I tell people, quit ignoring it. Go with your gut. Call the number. And, and call. And we have that number on our screen. We've been showing it throughout our um, talk here this evening, so that's a good thing. Um, so what do victims need the, the, the most? Oh, there's a whole list. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think at the top of the list is trust. We need to be able to trust that those people who are saying, hey, we're here for you, we want to help you, we want to support you, we need to trust that we're not going to be re-victimized and that you're coming at this not out of pity or um, your own guilt, but coming at this like, you know, we need, we need to help people in our community. And if one person is being trafficked, that's too many. And so the trust is a, is a big thing, and that takes time usually to build. And you know, we also need people to understand that 
there's no such thing as a perfect victim or survivor. And so uh, when we come into services or are seeking services, we may not always respond in a way that you would want us to right away because you know, it's so much more than just trafficking. Mm -hmm. Nobody is just a trafficking survivor. There's so much more. You're dealing with years of trauma, mm -hmm. addictions, mental health, homelessness. So, you know, we need a place to be that's safe. So, um, you know, there's a long list. <laughs> right. And then also there, um, legally, um, I know recently we have just a couple minutes left, but um, if you could talk about, we've done some things in the unicameral, there was a bill that was just passed um, that dealt with trafficking. Can you just briefly mention that and talk yes, about that? Yes, Senator Pansing Brooks, and thank you, Senator, um, for really bringing this up because, and I, we're seeing more and more coming up, um, but what LB 289 was gonna do is try to strengthen the penalties because not only do we need to help the survivors and the victims in our communities, but at the end of the day, we need to hold the offenders accountable for what they are doing. Mm -hmm. And that's the buyers and the sellers. And so this is, you know, we need to strengthen those penalties. Right now, there's not a lot criminally wise to, I think, discourage. So okay. by, you know, adding stiffer penalties, and especially when the victim is under the age of 18, uh, I think that kind of also sends a message that we're taking notice. And um, so I'm really happy to see that moving through and having had the opportunity to speak to that. So that was really good. Well, that's good. Any other last quick thing? We have about a minute to, that you'd <laughs> like to say, and let the viewers know. You know, there's, there's so many uh, things that any of us can do. Nobody has to do everything, but everybody can do something. And, you know, I'd say reach out to the national hotline and find out how you can get involved in your community and okay. how you can make a difference in end trafficking. Okay. And there's a website too for that. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for being here, sharing your story and the information for our viewers. Thank you. Thank you. For the League of Women Voters, I'm Jerry Simon reminding you to inform yourself about the issues and go vote Omaha.